Welcome to the Catholic Culture Podcast, dedicated to the Holy Family. I'm Thomas V. Miris. Today I'm talking to Father George Drantz about his calling both as a Jesuit priest and as an actor. This episode of the Catholic Culture Podcast is brought to you by the Catholic Culture Podcast. Hmm. If you enjoy this show, please go to iTunes or Apple Podcasts and leave us a rating and review. It helps other people to find our content. And if you don't know how to do that, there's a link with instructions at catholicculture.org slash podcast. Today's guest is Father George Drantz of the Society of Jesus. He is the artist-in-residence at Fordham University, where he teaches acting. He is a resident artist in La Mama's Great Jones Repertory Company, a very important hub of the New York experimental theater scene. And he is the artistic director of Magis Theater Company. We talked about what it's like being both a priest and a working actor, and we had a lengthy discussion of how to take custody of one's career and on how to choose one's roles with integrity, which I think will be helpful to any actors listening to this. As it happens, the day that this episode is coming out is Father George's birthday, which I did not plan in advance. So happy birthday, Father George. Father George, welcome to the Catholic Culture Podcast. Thank you, Thomas. It's great to be here. So I'm really curious about the discernment process and the experience of being a priest who's also an actor, a working actor, in terms of how you divide your time, all the little practical elements, and also the bigger picture of how being an actor or in any sort of what you might call a secular profession ties in and how you can live a unified life with being that and a priest. Sure. Well, let's talk about that second part first. When I was in my undergraduate years at Marquette University, I was expecting full well to be a professional actor for the rest of my life. And it was at Marquette that I saw the Jesuits and met many of the Jesuits there And seeing what they had done with their talents made me wonder if the Lord was not asking me to use my talents for his kingdom and for his glory in that way. So I was quite inspired by the Jesuit teachers that I had, a lot of the Jesuit musicians that were working in campus ministry at the time. And so it put me on a quest of really saying, well, what is God's will for me? Is is being an actor enough? And there was always a desire in me to really serve God and his people. And in learning more about the life of St. Ignatius and about the Society of Jesus, I really saw a possibility of, in the same way that these Jesuits were using their talents for the upbuilding of the kingdom, I might be able to do the same. In the formula of the Institute, which is about It's a document from the 16th century, which is about the closest thing that the Jesuits have to a rule. The formula of the Institute says that the society exists so that people might serve under Christ's banner, and that in doing so, we seek to help souls. And part of the way that we do that, Ignatius says, is through preaching and any other ministry of the word. Now, a lot of people think of the Jesuits as a teaching order, but we really only came upon teaching and education because that was a need that the church asked for us. Our real need always is to help souls and to bring souls to Christ. So teaching was a great way to do that, that through the lessons of the classroom, through the lessons of what we teach in a regular curriculum, if we truly believe that God can be present in all things, then one of the things that we do in the classroom, that I do in the classroom as I teach theater, is to really point to the presence of God, to point to these things that are present in our culture, that really are there as either yearnings of humanity to be united with God, or ways in which God has given us windows into seeing his presence already with us. So this idea of ministries of the word for the Jesuits has always been really part of this part of our vocation. I think it's very consonant, and I think I feel that my involvement in the theater has made me a better priest, and my involvement in the church has made me a better actor. 
In terms of the practical stuff of dividing time, well, I work as an artist in residence at Fordham University. And my mission given to me by my provincial superior is to work at Fordham University and to work in the New York theater. So that's really my mission. Mm. So what that means practically is that means that I do teach classes. I'm involved in the university community. I'm here at St. Malachy's, the Actors Chapel. Oh, that's someone right now. <laughs> and we at St. Malachy's, it's a full parish. And I've been here for a little over 12 years. But with the programming at St. Malachy's, there's a special care and concern for actors. And what I try to do is every year I try to offer some spiritual programming where people see the connection between their creative life and their spiritual life, but also in my preaching to make references to acting craft, to classical texts of acting, places where actors feel that they're welcomed here. And it's been a tremendous way to really reach out to the church community and the creative community as well. I also run a theater company, Magis Theater Company, and came out of a desire to really be a presence within the industry, and I freelance. So there are a lot of things. I mean, how do I divide the time? I look at the calendar <laughs> like anyone else, mm. and I say, well, what needs to be done today? Where are certain things? And by the grace of the Holy Spirit and, and God, at the end of the week, Pretty much everything gets done, but maybe not in the order that I originally planned. Hmm. So it's a juggling act, but it's a good one. Would you say that as a Jesuit and an actor, are you focusing in your work, even in the work you take on religiously oriented work or not necessarily? Well, one of the hallmarks of Jesuit spirituality is to seek and find God in all things. Now, a lot of times you hear that and people just say the last part of that, to find God in all things. And yes, that's necessary. But really, in order to find God, you actually have to seek God. Hmm. So I guess anything that I do, anything that I know I'm going to commit myself to as an actor, first I seek and I say, well, where is God in this story? Where is God in this is there a way to bring souls to a consciousness of God? Is there a way to work within this? I've turned down work as an actor because I felt it just was not consonant with what I hope to do as a priest, what it is that I hope to do as a human being. And it's not that I do explicitly religious work. It's that I look for the religious within whatever work I'm in. If I can find it, then I'm happy to be there. I'm happy to commit my time to it. But if it's empty or if it's something where I think is actually spiritually harmful, I'll stay away from it. So you've been, I don't know how you'd put it, a member of Great Jones Repertory. Is that right? Yes, that's and right. And that's, I don't know that much about this, but it's related to this sort of center of New York experimental theater called La Mama. And how long have you been involved with that? I first got involved in La Mama in 1996. My classmate, who is the artistic director right now, Mia Yu, she was uh, a student at Columbia at the same time that I was. And we were in class and she had mentioned a project that she thought that I might be right for. And so when we went to La Mama, uh, she said, well, everyone has to meet Ellen. Ellen was the person who founded La Mama, Ellen Stewart, a tremendous artist, committed Catholic, although she herself had a very ecumenical view of the world, and she appreciated all cultures and all religions. But Ellen was looking for a replacement in a piece that she was doing, and Mia was looking for an actor for a piece that we're going to be on tour together. So I met Ellen, we really hit it off, and I have been blessed to work with her on a number of her productions. When she passed away, we had her funeral at St. Patrick's Cathedral, which was really special in so many ways. Uh, St. Patrick's was Ellen's first stop when she came to New York from Chicago. She came here to be a designer, and the first thing that she did when she got to Manhattan was lit a candle at St. Patrick's. She went out the doors, and there was Saks Fifth Avenue, and that was her first job. So it was really wonderful to hear about Ellen's own spiritual journey and to be part of, of that over the years as well. So Ellen 
worked as a designer for many years. She was incredibly successful, the first woman of color to achieve that and did a lot of firsts because she was just that kind of person. When she lived in the East Village, there were some of her friends who couldn't get their things done in the regular theater. And I can't believe I just said that regular theater, but yeah, I mean, people kind of make that assumption that the experimental wing of the theater is something different. It is kind of wild, but it's it's also a place where a lot of what becomes mainstream theater really, really has its first steps. Case in point, these friends of Ellen's, who she sponsored really, were people like Sam Shepard, Edward Albee, and these young playwrights whose work wasn't really understood by many people, Ellen would produce it. So she gave up her idea of continuing as a designer to become a theater producer. Again, this was a very spiritual thing for her because when she started working as a young designer, she knew a man on Orchard Street who ran a fabric store, uh, Papa Diamond, she would call him, and he would save interesting pieces of of fabric for her and she would make these beautiful creations out of them and he said to her you have to get a push cart but it's going to be a push cart for for others a push cart was something that in the old times when people couldn't afford storefronts or couldn't afford property it was just a box with a wheel on it and you would go selling things in the east village there was a whole place where now I think it used to be an an open-air market, and then it was a closed market on First Avenue. Now it's, uh, it's an art center. But down the street from that is where Ellen lived. So Papa Diamond would talk to her about really pushing the cart for others. And that's what she's really done with La Mama, is she produced and produced and produced and really established a lot of people who were looking to find their way in the theater She supported them, she believed in them, and she was able to really give them a place to do that. La Mama still does that. La Mama produces probably close to 100 pieces of theater a year. They have some companies that have been resident companies like the Great Jones Company for many, many years, and they continue to find and foster new artists with new vision. So it's it's a tremendous honor and a great opportunity to be involved with La Mama as a resident artist there. This may seem like a very obvious question, but how would you define experimental theater? Is it possible to define it? Well, part of the reason why it's experimental is it's seeking new forms that have not yet really found themselves. So it's a kind of, I would say it's a kind of theater that is interested more in exploring questions than it is in coming up with a surefire hit commercial success. I think it looks at the medium of the art as a way of really looking at human questions, really trying to imagine and embody new forms. One of the things that's happening right now is Culture Hub. My friend Billy Clark is in charge of that. And through the technology that's available to us now, Culture Hub is doing things of theatrical live streams, a kind of a way of collaborating with people in different parts of the world at the same time. So a dancer in England might be uh, performing with a choir in Korea, but would be happening at the same time with an audience video hookup of one part and the other. I've participated in work sessions like that, workshops with actors all over the world through Culture Hub. So it's a way of of really looking at what's available to us now and, and how can we use the medium to really advance the art form. Just to clarify, were you a priest before you went to Columbia to study acting? Yes. Okay. I did my undergraduate work at Marquette University. I thought I was going to be an actor, but explored my vocation with the Jesuits. And so I entered the Jesuit novitiate after my junior year. When I completed my studies, I thought I was going to have to give up theater. But the more that I was given assignments, the places where I was, I may have been teaching or I may have been doing other ministries. But when people found out that I had a theater background, 
it was something that really excited the people that I was working with. So they asked me to continue to look at that, to use those skills in the ministry. And my religious superiors noticed that and encouraged me, said, maybe theater is a way that you can bring a lot more to the church and to your ministry. So they gave me permission to do my advanced studies at Columbia. And it was there that I met artists like Anne Bogart, Andre Serban, Priscilla Smith, Nikki Volz, Marcus Stern, Andre Gregory, some real big movers and shakers in the theater world, people who really inspired me in my own work. Did people at the time you were studying, and this of course applies to your your work in the world since then, did people know you were a priest? And if so, how did they respond to that? Well, I always find that it's better that people find out that I'm a priest. I like people to know me first as a colleague, and there's something within the environment of a rehearsal room where one of the qualities that people are looking to foster in a rehearsal is an openness. People have all kinds of baggage. I I think maybe unjustified baggage with the church and with clergy. And some people, if they hear that I'm a priest, they shut down or they bring all of that baggage into the room. And so you really don't have a free space in which you can work. So it's not that I ever deny my priesthood. I think that would be terrible. But what I do is I let people experience me first as a colleague, first as a fellow artist. Then as things naturally come up in conversation, I might be just talking about, well, I was giving a homily once, or I might say, well, I was working in a hospital and And then people would begin to ask things like, well, how do you get to do all these things? And that's when I say, well, you get to give a homily. (laughs) Right. Well, and so in the right moment, I let people know about my priesthood. What I find happens with that is people who maybe thought they had their minds made up about what the church was, or people who thought that the church was closed or was any number of adjectives that you want to put on it, people have a lot of derogatory things that they say about the church. But if people can experience people of the church first, and through our example, bring them to an awareness that we are all in this together, that we're not as as closed as people would like to think of, then what happens is inside them, they do the work themselves. I don't have to convince them. I don't have to defend. I simply do my work, try to be as excellent as I can within my work, stand firm in who I am as a person of faith. And then when the moment of revealing that faith comes, it happens very, very naturally. It's also provided many opportunities for me to minister to people. There was one time where I was working on a show in Italy with Ellen. And there was a man in the cast who said, I heard you're a priest. And I said, yes, I am. He said, I've been away from the church for about 17 years. You're really someone that I could talk to. I'd like you to hear my confession. I think it might be time to go back. But if I had not been there, if I had not been out working in the field, then very often these people who really need to be ministered to would not find themselves in a place where they can receive the grace of the church, where they can be reconciled to the church in that way. You talked a bit about having to turn down certain roles and and choosing your roles carefully, even if it might not be a role that is morally compromising exactly, but you have a sense of who you are as an artist as well as a priest and what fits in with what you're trying to do as an artist, of course. But I'm sort of curious because, you know, I know a lot of actors and it can be very difficult and especially in a in the world of something like experimental theater where it's like anything goes to a certain degree. How do you navigate that, especially as an actor who's starting out and doesn't have as much of the luxury, so to speak, of picking your roles that, that mm. you play? And and how, how was that personally for you? Was that awkward at times or... Well, when I first started out as an actor and when I didn't have a whole lot of voice in the industry, what I noticed was that there is something within the actor that thinks, 
unless I do everything according to the way that they want me to do it, I'll never work again. I realize that that is the voice of the devil. (laughs) I realize that that is not something that I ought to be listening to that anyone ought to be listening to. It's, it's, it's a voice of fear. It's a voice that shuts you down creatively. And it's a voice that makes you inauthentic. It actually makes your work worse because you're trying to be something else that you think they want to be. Well, I came to the conclusion that I am who I am and I am who God made me. And if I were to go against that, how could I give an authentic performance? So what I began doing was I began really choosing who I wanted to work with. I remember having a conversation with my agent and after a while he, he was sending me out on things and I had to tell him why I was turning down certain things and why I wasn't for him. It was about the money. It was about the opportunity to get exposure, all of the things that you think about commercially. I said, well, you know, I'm just not interested in those things. I have different interests and I'm doing it this way. Well, I explained to him about my priesthood. He actually started working with me before he knew I was a priest. So I said, well, this is, again, this is who I am. And these are the kinds of things that I want to do. Now, a lot of people think that in order to work in the industry, you can't take that amount of real ownership of your own career that you have to kind of kowtow or you have to just take what's there. On a certain level, that might be the truth. But why would I want to go there? Why would I want to do those things? I had a quite, I had a very funny instance once where I had just done Cymbeline at the Delacorte Theater, the New York Shakespeare Festival. I was in in the ensemble, one of the solo singers in in the ghost scene in the the last part of the play, and you know, so I was with a friend of mine. And we were with his agent afterward. And she said, you look really familiar. And I said, well, I was in so-and-so's class and, you know, we, we worked together. You probably saw the thesis production. She said, oh yeah, I love your work. It's really great. And, and then my friend said, oh, and George is a priest. Her face changed completely. And she got that kind of like, look like she was chewing on a lemon or something. And she said, oh, So does that mean that there's a certain work that you wouldn't do? And I said quite naturally, well, I would like to think that there would be certain work that I wouldn't do even if I weren't a priest. But that concept doesn't seem to be something that's really out there in the industry. Or if it does, it it seems like it's only something that you earn or you get to. I realized for myself that I had to take ownership a better word might be I had to take custody. I had to take custody of my career and let people know that this is not just my career, it's God's career. And what I do now is I wait to see what comes along. I weigh certain possibilities. And if there's something that I really think is is where God is calling me, that's where I'll put my focus. I've been very blessed over the years that choosing who I work with, choosing the kinds of projects that I want, what happens is people begin to understand my work a little bit more. They understand my desires. And then the right projects come along. The right things come my way. And in those times where I don't have anything, there's plenty of work of my own that I want to work on. One of the things was translating this Calderon piece that we were speaking about earlier. Yeah. Well, I'd love to get to that in a, in a little bit. So it sounds like from what you're saying that talking about as picking and choosing your work as a luxury, you know, at least in moral terms, as a luxury for people who are at a higher level in their career is really false. It's just a necessity uh, for your artistic integrity as much as your moral integrity as a human being. I think that's the truth. And I think people think that in order for uh, success to come, there is a one way blueprint or trajectory that you have to follow. And if people are terrorized about making mistakes along the way that could ruin their career or that could not open the degree of success that they believe is theirs. As far as I'm concerned, 
I think the degree of the success that I'm enjoying today is the degree of success that God wants me to have. And if it's going to give glory to his name, that's wonderful. If it's better that I accompany people on another level or devote time to my teaching or devote time to any of my other pursuits, then that's fine too. But we're so put upon in this country to define our success by what the market says that a lot of times people don't even realize how much they are swept up into the current of the market so that they can't give themselves the beauty and the joy of seeing that in God's eyes, they already are a success. In God's eyes, they already are everything that they need to be. We continue to work at ourselves. We continue, as John Paul II said, to work on the masterpiece that is our own life. And if we do that with God, we're going to be happy by and large. If we compromise uh, certain things, it's one of those things that's, that's really up to the heart and the conscience of every actor. But for them, sometimes you'll hear people say, well, I didn't have a choice. I had to take that. Well, I mean, there are economic concerns, there are other things, but can I trust that everything's going to work out if I really take the work that is most meaningful to me? That might mean that I have to make certain financial sacrifices. That might mean that I'm unable to do certain things that I would like to be able to do with a little bit more of an advantage one way or the other. But I have to constantly weigh those things and to say, well, where is God calling me at the moment? And what does this choice allow to happen, not only for me, but also for the ministry that I find myself in? Yeah, it's interesting. I was talking to a person previously on this podcast about how even tenured professors who are about as secure as you can get are often unwilling to face disapproval for speaking what they believe to be true. And and yet you hear people saying, well, when I get tenure, I'll speak out more. That's just self-deception on a certain level. And it's the same with acting. I mean, if you're a slave to the world, then you're a slave to the, you're going to continue to be a slave to the world when you when you make it big. It may manifest itself in different ways but it's, it's still going to be the same basic dynamic that you're playing out in the career choices that you make. And there are ways in which that idea of, of slave is, is a good one because we basically forge our own chains by the choices that we make. Am I going to be chained to someone's idea of who I am? Am I going to be chained to what people... It's a very funny thing. If you ever go into a casting office, they have these labels that they put on on how they see you. Commercially, they're going to say, well, this person falls into that slot and this person falls into that slot. In the commercial world, there are different casting directors who really don't know where to put me or who put me one place and another casting director puts me in a completely different place because I've had the advantage and and the ability to play so many vastly different roles and to work on so many vastly different projects. So, I mean, for some people, they would say that that's that's kind of like not really smart career management because you should find your type, you should know what it is, and you should always play in that well, that sounds like something where that's going to guarantee that you get to do work on other people's terms, but it doesn't really seem to foster a kind of ability to do the kind of work that you feel you're really called to. And so even in the times where I'm not getting a whole lot of commercial work, I find those are the perfect times to really focus on the projects that I want to develop later, that I want to be prepared for, that I want to explore on my own. I think a lot of it just boils down to trust. Can I trust that God is going to show me what it is that's going to be best for my work right now? And if it looks like things are a little precarious because of one or another circumstance, can I trust that God is actually leading me through this, not as a problem, but as a way to really discover what is the deepest reality that God wants me to consider, that God wants me to look at, and that God wants me to operate from. I heard a comedian once describe actors as cups waiting to be filled by coffee because they they don't 
create their own work. They are waiting to be hired by someone. But it sounds like uh, there's a great practical advantage here to and a great freedom in having an interior life as an actor and creating your own work so that you're not entirely subject to what people decide to offer you at any given moment. Even if it's just the interior work of working on your craft in the privacy of your own home, even if you're not writing scripts or anything like that, it sounds like that's there's a real, aside from the fulfillment of the work itself, there's a real advantage to be had there of independence, whether you're making any money on it or not. Absolutely. That's so true, Thomas. I, I remember something that a teacher told us in graduate school. She said, I'm going to give you the greatest secret about practice. The greatest secret about practice is that you do it. <laughs> now, why is that the greatest secret? Because people say they have a practice and then when they feel like it's too much or they feel tired or they feel frustrated, they abandon the practice. But artistic practice, spiritual practice are things that you really make a commitment to. And if you can make the commitment that no matter what they're saying, the people that are holding the carafe of coffee, you as a cup can be filled with whatever it is that you want to be. And if they're not pouring the coffee in right now, fill it with something else. Fill it with your own practice, with your own work. In a lot of ways, the spiritual practice and the artistic practice stem from the same place. They stem from the belief that God is active in the world and that we, as co-creators with God, we commit ourselves to seeking that, to observing it, and to be able to point to it for others. I think a good spiritual life does that. I think a good artistic life does that. So how can I use my downtime to really work on something that I think is a beautiful piece of art, work on a monologue that I think is really going to be a good thing for me to do as an artist that really helps me to explore certain things. Sometimes to work on material for my craft that I think might be pointed at some of the spiritual questions that I have, you know, to bring my prayer into some of my analysis and my work and my laying the foundation within my creative work. I remember once in a rehearsal as a director, I was talking to an actor and I said, how's your prayer life? And she said, I don't think anyone's ever asked me that in a rehearsal before. I said, well, you know why I'm asking for it. Kind of in, this, in this particular scene, this person is really struggling spiritually with, someone, with something. How can you relate to that? So many of the things, especially in the classic works, the spiritual reality is just as deep as the physical reality. But because it's a question that we've brushed aside, a lot of people now who, who look at Shakespeare, who look at Spanish Golden Age, who look at the ancient Greeks, they look at it at a particularly secular, God-stripped worldview, as opposed to looking at it in a way where where the idea of divine presence is actually charging the the decisions and the stakes and all of the work that my character is doing, that the dramatic action of the piece is based on. It seems to me that it's better to be not a full-time artist than to... Well, let me put that differently because an artist is an artist no matter what he's doing, but not a full-time career artist than to be an artist in a way that compromises your artistic nature. And I think people need to realize that there's no shame in having a day job and being an artist. I mean, some of the greatest artists in history have done that. I think of Nathaniel Hawthorne. He was a customs officer, I think. Paul Gauguin was a stockbroker. Anton Chekhov was a physician. So this idea that success is determined by your ability to support yourself with your craft or with your art. That's a very recent idea. And that if you are supporting yourself by something else, you're dismissed as an artist or you're questioned as an artist. That mentality, I think there's just really no place for it. It's an artificial mentality and it really doesn't help anyone. I think there are many different ways of measuring artistic success. And I think 
what you were talking about before of what's better or what's worse, I wouldn't really want to prescribe that. I think anyone is going to find their their own path. But I would hope that they would realize that they don't have to be bound by other people's impressions of what a success is. That, again, as I said earlier, we already have the greatest success, which is God's complete and unconditional love. Everything else is just decoration. But as far as I'm concerned, I don't need to be more successful than that. Everything that I do, I want to give glory to God because of that gift. Everything else that I do, I want to invite others into the joy of what that means. And I want to create opportunities to embody that in my work. But I don't want to be judged by some kind of market a determination of of what a success is. I think the question is much bigger. Great. So you mentioned Calderon de la Barca and a translation of his work that you were working on. Now, I came to a Lenten retreat that you gave at St. Malachy's, and I think there were five or six of them. I only, unfortunately, was able to make it to one. But you were working through this version of Life is a Dream. Can you tell us about that piece and the importance that it's had to you in your life and the work that you've done on it? Sure. Well, when I was in grad school, I was working backstage on a production of Life is a Dream. Calderon, when he was 36 years old, wrote this first version. He was a young up-and-coming playwright. This really put him on the map. It was this very, very popular philosophical and kind of romantic epic play that's played in the Spanish court and that really established him as one of Spain's greatest playwrights, one of the world's greatest playwrights for that matter. Well, Calderon enjoyed this success. He became very, very successful, but he was unsatisfied. So at the age of 50 or so, I believe, uh, maybe 40, maybe even younger, he explored his spiritual side and he became a priest. He told the court that he didn't want to write anymore. On their insistence, they said, no, you will. You will continue to write. He said, fine, but I'm going to concentrate on this other form, which was the auto sacramental. And the auto sacramental was a kind of exploration of the grace of the sacraments in a dramatic form. So he would look at some of the great myths of the ancient world, the stuff that was going on the stage of the Baroque opera at that time or the Golden Age theater at that time. You know, they were looking to the stories of Odysseus and, you know, the conquests of all of these great heroes of antiquity. So Calderon started to look at the spiritual underpinnings behind these old myths. And so, for example, he would take the myth of Orpheus and he wrote a play called El Divino Orfeo, the divine Orpheus. How has Christ come and gone into the underworld and rescued us? He wrote all of these different rewritings of these old stories. And then what he started to do is he started to go back to his own plays and to say, well, what was going on spiritually in my younger work? And how do I look at those works which were very popular, but really point them toward a a deeper spiritual reality? So I don't know of anyone else who has done this, but a great successful playwright who goes back to his old works and rewrites them completely. And he does it again and again. So his play, El Mayor Encanto Amor, which is Love the Greatest Enchantments, the Odysseus and Circe story. He writes it again and it becomes a play called Los Encantos de la Culpa, the Enchantments of Sin. So again, you see what he's doing. With Life is a Dream, it's the only one where he didn't change the title. He kept the title the same when it was the epic play and it was the auto sacramental. So in the epic play, the question is, is Prince Segismundo a fitting ruler for Poland? In the auto, he makes that, is the human being a fitting caretaker for the universe? So he takes the same question, but he changes the stakes and he looks at it from a divine perspective. 
The first story is about this prince that is prophesied to become a tyrannical ruler. And so the father locks him in a tower from his infancy to protect the people. In the auto, it's, it's how we are enchained by our own sin. We are enchained by our own disobedience, not locked up in a tower, but locked up first in those things that we do to ourselves, where we don't follow what's been given us, where we can't give ourselves open to grace. And so in the same way that in the first story, it's about the liberation and the change and the transformation of Segismundo to be a man of conscience and to be a ruler who takes possession of himself. In the second one, it introduces the characters of free will and understanding. Now, you can't get more allegorical than that, but showing throughout the decisions that man makes how free will and understanding can be working in harmony with each other. So beautiful things like that. And actually, I worked on that with my colleague, Alfredo Galvan, and. I think we're the only English language translation of that play. In the English speaking world, a lot of Calderon's plays are relegated to some dusty library someplace. They dismiss a lot of the spiritual work and they're interested in the younger courtly work. But I think his later stuff shows a much more philosophical depth, a real strong questioning about the meaning of life and it's fantastic to see the perspective of the same artist with the same material, but to see what he does that as a 36-year-old and then as a 77-year-old. So is your translation available for people to get? or It's actually not. It's not published yet. We're hoping to publish it sometime soon, but right now we are in the sole possession of that translation. Sometimes for personal use or for academic use, uh, I do allow people to to look at the translation, but we this is where the business world comes back. Sometimes we've been burned by our generosity in the past, and people have taken advantage of our generosity as a company and taken the scripts that we have as our own and not given us credit for them. And in order to protect the integrity of the script, what we like to do is we like to find out exactly how it's going to be used before we allow someone to, to use it. So tell me about Magis. Sure. It's a company that was founded in around 2005. We started out as a group of friends who went through the MFA program at Columbia together. We realized that there wasn't a place that we could go where we could continue the kind of training that we started in graduate school. So we said, well, let's do it with each other. Let's teach each other. Let's find out how our exploration, our own personal practice over the years has really worked on some of the stuff that we did in graduate school. How did these different art forms that we're working on now or these different influences that we've worked on since, how did they come together? At the time, I was helping out at the Notre Dame School of Manhattan, uh, which is run by the Sisters of the Society of Ursula. And they got a new building and they said, is there anything that you could imagine happening with this auditorium? And I said, well, as a matter of fact, I have some friends who are interested in starting a company. So we became partners with Notre Dame School and Magis acts as a consultant. Uh, we ran the drama program for years. Now we kind of help out with the drama teacher who's ever on staff there. But then we also have been able to consider Notre Dame our home. So it's really through the generosity of those sisters in that school that we're able to exist. We're a very grassroots theater company. We don't believe in the need to do you know, big flashy stuff. We're really interested just in the exploration of the acting technique and how our exploration of the technique can actually be a gift to the acting community and to our audiences. So we take on scripts that are not often done. We like to look at neglected classics like that second Calderon piece that I was talking about. We've done uh, third century Sanskrit plays. Most recently, we did mystical poetry from the Persian, Muslim, the Jewish, and the Christian tradition, especially San Juan de la Cruz, St. John of the Cross. Yeah, I saw that. That was a beautiful performance. Oh, thank you. Yeah, but just to take texts that 
aren't normally done or aren't given a commercial run and to really devote our energies to that. So Magis does that in terms of our selection of material. But then we meet together every week as artists to keep our own craft fresh, but also to kind of look at what are the things at the foundation of our technique that really can be applied to all technique. So we've come up with our own theatrical vocabulary, if you will, that we share with other actors and artists once a month in our open training sessions. We've done now in workshops all over the world. A lot of the Magis work that we do has become adopted by other companies and we partner with other companies in terms of training and laying the foundation for actor training through that. So we're very blessed to have a threefold mission to train together and to explore our training that way to teach as uh, teaching artists and giving workshops and then to act in our own performances and bring these texts to people who might not ever have had the chance to see them. Is there any particular focus in your training method? Is it like body work or what, what kind of things do you do? Well, we try to do is to recognize uh, from a purely artistic aspect that what the actor is trying to do on stage is to recreate impulse. Now, what is impulse? That's the question. A lot of people will define it very narrowly. They'll say it comes from the id, or they'll say it comes from this, or it's a, it comes from the body, or from the mind, or from the imagination. But we say that the body, the mind, the imagination, the spirit, the voice, they're all connected. And impulse happens... And in order for impulse to be truly embodied, it has to be understood on all of those levels. So our work really strives to create a kind of a forum and an opportunity and a way of creating in a very tangible, conscious way for the actor what is happening on a very unconscious level. I get an idea and I have to express it. I express it with my body. I express it with my voice. It just comes out. But very often, body training is done separately than vocal training. Vocal training is whisked off to the ivory tower and all kinds of do's and don'ts are said about what you can and can't do with your body while you're speaking. There's a lot of isolationism and compartmentalization in acting training. Magis takes a very holistic view of what can happen with acting technique. And we try to say that what we want to do is we want to look at where these techniques overlap, where these techniques reinforce each other. How can we create a language that facilitates an integrity of the person and an integrity of the technique without kind of a broken down compartmentalization fundamentalism that you find in in other techniques now continuing along the lines of training i've heard that you did an adaptation of the odyssey for students is that right yes so can you tell us about that sure this is a piece that's very dear to my heart when i was 17 years old in huntington high school i was working with a group called creative educational systems and they did this adaptation of the odyssey joseph brockett wrote it and it was really about how Odysseus's life journey was a metaphor for each person's life journey. So throughout some of the encounters that he has, uh, he faces his own doubt. He faces external pressure from like peer pressure. The lotus eaters deal with alcohol and drug addiction. Circe deals with temptation and self-deception. And a lot of the things in the play are about things that young people face. The final face-off with Scylla and Charybdis is basically a face-off that any person has, uh, you know, to be or not to be. And do I give up? Do I succumb to my own doubts? Do I look at other people's judgments? Or do I, do I forge through? Do I find the way through? Can I face the danger? Can I trust? Can I go through? So we've been working with the Odyssey, this adaptation by Creative Educational Systems, and we've been doing it in different places, most recently on the Pine Ridge Reservation at Red Cloud High School. 
and we're looking to expand that program. We also are in conversation with the Sheen Center about ways in which that can become part of their programming with young people there. In conversation with a group called Thrive for Life Ministries, where they serve people who are incarcerated and recently incarcerated. Thrive for Life is, is hopefully using our Odyssey project as part of their, their personal formation program. So we like to be able to put our art and our technique, our workshops, and what we do at the service of society to whole, as a whole. You have an upcoming show called Miracle in Rwanda. Can you tell us about that, where it's playing and what it's about? Sure. One of our company members, Leslie Lewis, has worked over the years on an adaptation of Immaculé Ilibagiza's book, Left to Tell. And in it, Immaculé chronicles her survival of the Rwandan genocide. Leslie was just named as the official artist of the United Nations to commemorate the 25-year anniversary of the Rwandan genocide. She's taken this play all over the world, and right now, Magis is working on it with her and with a great production team for a six-week run at the Lion Theater on Theater Row. That'll happen in April the same time as the commemoration of the Rwandan genocide. Leslie will also have a presentation of the work at the United Nations General Assembly, and we're very, very excited about that. It's a beautiful story about how Immaculate survived. It tells the story of the genocide, but it also tells the story of her ability to come to terms with what was going on and how she does that through her own prayer. She was the only way that she could survive was to hide in an incredibly small bathroom with, I think, seven other people. And she found the rosary. And through her prayer of the rosary, she was able to deal with a lot of what was going on. So the story chronicles the events of the genocide, but also takes you on Immaculate's spiritual journey. It's a beautiful piece. I saw Leslie perform it in a couple of different places. And so Magis is very, very honored to be a part of that right now. Um, That's happening in April. Uh, We may be having advanced programming, so people can look at our website, magistheater.org. That's theater with an R-E rather than an E-R. Magistheater.org for more information about upcoming things with Miracle in Rwanda. Are there any other upcoming events or anything that people can look forward to? We are working on one of Thornton Wilder's more obscure plays. That's for the next year. He wrote a cycle based on the Alcestis myth. We're very excited about that. We also have more work with the Odyssey Project that we're doing. So we're very, very happy about that. We have our monthly training, which is open to not only to actors, but other artists. People have come to that and found it to be a very inspiring thing for their craft, a a way to stimulate their imagination. So those are some of our ongoing projects. And the Odyssey Project is also something that we're continuing to do. Okay, great. Well, Father George, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your experience with us. Thank you, Thomas. Pleasure to be here. This week's excerpt is from Blessed John Henry Newman once again, this time from his The Idea of a University. This is from Discourse 3, The Bearing of Theology on Other Branches of Knowledge. He has just been talking about the attributes that God possesses in himself and his involvement with nature and nature's laws. And in this bit I'm about to read, he is talking about God's intimate involvement with and sovereignty over human affairs. And so in the intellectual, moral, social, and political world, man with his motives and works, his languages, his propagation, his diffusion is from him. Agriculture, medicine, and the arts of life are his gifts. 
Society, laws, government, he is their sanction. The pageant of earthly royalty has the semblance and the benediction of the eternal king. Peace and civilization, commerce and adventure, wars when just, conquest when humane and necessary, have his cooperation and his blessing upon them. The course of events, the revolution of empires, the rise and fall of states, the periods and eras, the progresses and the retrogressions of the world's history, not indeed the incidental sin overabundant as it is, but the great outlines and the results of human affairs are from his disposition. The elements and types and seminal principles and constructive powers of the moral world, in ruins though it be, are to be referred to him. He enlighteneth every man that cometh into this world. His are the dictates of the moral sense, and the retributive reproaches of conscience. To him must be ascribed the rich endowments of the intellect, the irradiation of genius, the imagination of the poet, the sagacity of the politician, the wisdom, as scripture calls it, which now rears and decorates the temple, now manifests itself in proverb or in parable. The old saws of nations, the majestic precepts of philosophy, the luminous maxims of law, the oracles of individual wisdom, the traditionary rules of truth, justice, and religion, even though embedded in the corruption or alloyed with the pride of the world, betoken his original agency and his long-suffering presence. Even where there is habitual rebellion against him, or profound, far-spreading social depravity, still the undercurrent, or the heroic outburst of natural virtue, as well as the yearnings of the heart after what it has not, and its presentiment of its true remedies, are to be ascribed to the author of all good. Anticipations or reminiscences of his glory haunt the mind of the self-sufficient sage and of the pagan devotee. His writing is upon the wall, whether of the Indian fane or of the porticos of Greece. He introduces himself. He all but concurs, according to his good pleasure and in his selected season, in the issues of unbelief, superstition, and false worship, and he changes the character of acts by his overruling operation. He condescends, though he gives no sanction, to the altars and shrines of imposture, and he makes his own fiat the substitute for its sorceries. He speaks amid the incantations of Balaam, raises Samuel's spirit in the witch's cavern, prophesies of the Messiah by the tongue of the Sibyl, forces Python to recognize his ministers, and baptizes by the hand of the misbeliever. He is with the heathen dramatist in his denunciations of injustice and tyranny, and his auguries of divine vengeance upon crime. Even on the unseemly legends of a popular mythology he casts his shadow, and is dimly discerned in the ode or the epic, as in troubled water or in fantastic dreams. All that is good, all that is true, all that is beautiful, all that is beneficent, be it great or small, be it perfect or fragmentary natural as well as supernatural, moral as well as material, comes from him. All right, friends, thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Do the actors or other artists in your life a favor and share this one with them. I think it'll be helpful. It certainly was to me. May God bless you, and I'll see you next week. 